One way to stay young and to hold back the aging process is to avoid excessive exposure to stress. Now, stress is part of everyday life, and some stress is actually good for you. You know, let's face it, life would be pretty bland without some stress to add a bit of spice. But when things get out of hand, excessive stress can have profound effects on both your physical and psychological well-being. If all isn't right on the inside, that's often reflected on the outside. And in many cases, that causes you to look older than you really are. And there are two ways of coping with excessive stress. First of all, you can deal with the stress and find ways of overcoming it, or better still, avoid it altogether. Now let's look at how you can deal with the stress. And the best way to deal with stress is just to relax. Now. Relaxation is different for different people. Why do some people age faster than others? And that's a question that has perplexed many people for many, many years. For example, all the people on this website were born in 1951, and that makes them pensionable age in most countries in the world. Yet, as you can see, some of them have uh, stood the test of time much better than some of their peers. Now, why is that? Well, a lot of it is down to genetics. If your parents and grandparents aged quickly, then it's likely that you will too. And, frankly, there's not much you can do about that, other than grow old gracefully. But the converse is also true. If your parents and grandparents look youthful, then chances are that you will too. Lifestyle also plays a role in how quickly you age, and you can change that. Smoking, for example, changes the skin, teeth and hair in ways that can add years to your looks. It also affects everything from your fertility to the strength of your heart, lungs and bones. In fact, a recent study of twins, where one twin smoked and the other didn't, showed considerable differences in appearance. And in some cases, the twin who smoked looked up to five years older than the twin who didn't smoke or who hadn't smoked for as long. And differences included more sagging of the upper eyelids, baggier lower eyelids and bags under the eyes. They had more facial wrinkles, including lines between the nose and mouth, wrinkling of the upper and lower lips, and sagging chins. And signs of ageing were most pronounced on the lower parts of the face. So, if you don't want to appear old before your time, quit smoking. Or better yet, don't start smoking at all. Exposure to sunshine is also a factor. The UV rays from sunshine can cause irrevocable damage to your skin. Now, of course, there's not much you can do about that if you live in a hot country where the sun shines all the time. Uh, you're going to have to go outside at some point or another and you're going to be exposed to the sunshine. But you should limit the exposure as much as possible and wear sunscreen or sunblock and the higher the factor, the better. And a tanning bed or sun lamp can be even worse because you're exposed to the uh, ultraviolet rays all the time. Uh, at least when you're sunbathing, sometimes the cloud comes over the sun and you're in a bit of shade. But when you're using a sunbed or you're using um, a tanning bed or a sun lamp, then uh, you're exposed to it all the time. And some of these sun beds, of course, you're being exposed all the way around your body at the same time. Whereas, of course, when you're sunbathing, just uh, lying out on a towel or on a sun lounger, uh, the sun's only hitting one half of your body at the same time. So, of course, the message is stay out of the sun if you want to keep young. The work you do can also leave its mark on your appearance. If you work outdoors, you're going to get more exposure to the sun compared to people who work indoors. 
but there are other forces at play as well. If you have a very stressful occupation, it can cause you to age very quickly, you know, sometimes by as much as a decade. And just look at how quickly politicians age when they're in office. I mean, for example, look at these two photographs of US President Barack Obama. You can see the one on the left was taken when he was running for president in 2008, and the one on the right is a more recent one taken in 2016. And you'll notice that he has aged quite considerably. His hair's gone grey, he's got deep lines round his eyes and round his mouth and on his brow, his skin's got paler and so on. But of course, uh, Obama has actually fared quite well compared to some of his predecessors. Uh, viewers who are old enough to remember Jimmy Carter will know that he aged, gosh, must have looked about 20 years older uh, by the end of his presidency than he did at the beginning. And he was only president for one term. But of course, it was all the extra stress of an imploding economy. And then, of course, the Iran hostage crisis that dogged the last half of his presidency. And he had a lot of stress and he looked much, much older by the time he left office than it was when he began. So stress does play a factor in how you look. And that's because chronic stress accelerates premature aging by shortening DNA telomeres. And a wide range of studies have shown that the stress caused by things like untreated depression, social isolation, long-term unemployment, anxiety attacks, and so on, can speed up the aging process by shortening the length of each DNA strand. And that's according to the people at Psychology Today. And your job might also expose you to toxins. Now, this could be because you work with hazardous material, or it could be that there's background pollution or background radiation, that sort of thing, in your workplace. So if you know you're going to be working with hazardous or toxic materials, then be sure to wear the appropriate protective equipment. Now, in most countries, your employer has a duty of care to provide this. And if they don't, then it's a worthwhile investment for you to actually go out and buy it and pay for it out of your own pocket. But if you find that your job is making you sick, and that's something else that can aid you, quite frankly, you're better off finding another one. And these are just some of the factors that mean that some people age quicker than others. One way to stay young and to hold back the aging process is to avoid excessive exposure to stress. Now, stress is part of everyday life, and some stress is actually good for you. You know, let's face it, life would be pretty bland without some stress to add a bit of spice. But when things get out of hand, excessive stress can have profound effects on both your physical and psychological well-being. If all isn't right on the inside, that's often reflected on the outside. And in many cases, that causes you to look older than you really are. And there are two ways of coping with excessive stress. First of all, you can deal with the stress and find ways of overcoming it, or better still, avoid it altogether. Now let's look at how you can deal with the stress. And the best way to deal with stress is just to relax. Now, relaxation is different for different people. For some people, it might mean following a hobby. Or it might mean playing sport or watching their favourite team. It might mean taking a vacation or a short break. Or it might mean just putting some distance between you and the stressful situation. Another way of dealing with stress is through hypnosis. Now, I can personally attest to the fact that this does work. Uh, some years ago, I was under a lot of stress. I had a job that I hated, working for someone who absolutely detested me and was desperately trying to get me fired at every opportunity. Um, I split up with my girlfriend. Uh, We've been going out for a couple of years, but it was quite obvious that our relationship had pretty much run its course. And although 
uh, I suppose it was amicable as breakups go, it was still very unpleasant and very stressful. And then on top of all that, I was involved in a car crash. Uh, a guy ran a red light and crashed into the side of my car and damaged it, not enough to make it a total write-off, but enough to make it undrivable. And it turned out that he had no insurance. He wasn't in the country legally. Uh, the address he gave me was one that he'd moved away from a couple of years ago. And the paint and body shop that I took the car to was trying to rip me off. And it was all very, very stressful. And I started to get um, panic attacks. I was not sleeping very well. And some guy came to my work and didn't know my name and was asking for me and said he was a tall guy, 30 something. And I was 22 at the time. So that didn't go down too well either. So I decided to undergo some hypnotherapy because I'd read about it in a magazine. And I found a hypnotherapist. Actually, I found her out of the yellow pages and her office was about a five minute walk from where I worked. And I had a couple of sessions with this hypnotherapist and she put me into a deep, relaxing, hypnotic trance. It was the most deep, relaxing feeling I've ever felt. And she gave a couple of um, post hypnotic suggestions one of which was a trigger word. And she said, every time you say this word to yourself, you'll feel as relaxed as you are now. And it worked. And she recorded the session so I could play them back every day to reinforce the post-hypnotic suggestions. I used to listen to them last thing at night before I went to bed so that I would be nice and relaxed so I could get a decent night's sleep and so on. And it really, really helped. And um, I highly recommend it. Now, of course, the best way to avoid stress is just to avoid stressful situations in the first place. And this isn't always possible, but there are some things that you can do to minimize the situations that cause you the stress. So think about what is causing you to be stressed and then devise ways of dealing with them. Now, let's take workplace stress, for example. You know, lots of people feel very stressed at work. and in my own case, from when I was going through a very stressful time, I found that the only way to actually deal with this stress was to basically find another job because it was quite clear that my boss hated my guts and he was going to get me fired sooner or later. So I might as well leave and find another job, which I did. And um, my stress levels went down quite considerably. And if you have a job, then again, discussing the situation with your superiors is probably the best thing to do. In my case, it wouldn't have made any difference, but uh, in other cases, it can help. Something else you can do is to turn off your work cell phone out of hours so you're not getting work calls uh, when you're on your own time. And likewise, not checking work emails when you're at home. And also socializing with people from outside your work can be helpful because when you socialize with people from your work, what do you talk about? Work. So when you socialize with people from outside of your work, then you're going to talk about something different and it's going to take your mind off work and it's not going to be quite so stressful. Also, if you find getting to and from your workplace is very stressful, then you might want to change your route. You might want to drive a different route. You might want to uh, take public transport instead of driving or vice versa, because sometimes actually just getting to your work can be very stressful. And finally, if nothing else is going to work, then you have to do what I did, which is to change jobs or change careers if necessary to find something that is actually much less stressful. Now, of course, if you're an entrepreneur, then your stress levels can be almost off the scale compared to people who have a job. So what you need to do to try and keep the stress levels down is, first of all, to keep regular hours. Now, I know when you're an entrepreneur, you can keep thinking about your business all the time, but you want to make sure that you keep regular hours, that you're only available to clients during regular office hours and that you only work during office hours and that you actually do take some time off. 
you want to have a dedicated place to work from. Now, this could be a room in your home if you have a home office. Um, if you have, you know, not a lot of space at home, then just have somewhere that's a dedicated place in your living room to work from. You know, get an old fashioned roll top desk that you can shut and uh, basically separate you from your work physically from time to time. You should obviously take regular breaks, you should take regular vacations, you should take time off. And when you're not involved in running your business, you should make sure like when you have a job that uh, your cell phone is turned off, that you're not checking your emails and so on, so that you do actually get some time away from your work. And you should outsource tasks that you find stressful. I know a lot of people find doing the books to be very stressful. So hire a bookkeeper or an accountant to do that for you and of course that frees up more time anyway for you to do things that you enjoy and for you to actually work on your business and also you want to network with other people in your industry and this is very important because any problems that you're facing that are making you stressed are also going to be problems that other people in your industry are facing so you when you talk to people in your industry and you share your problems then there's a good chance that someone is going to say oh well that happened to me and i did such and such and that's going to solve the problem and you're not going to be stressed about it and there are a couple of ways you can do this you can do this in person or you can do it via a discussion forum and there are lots and lots of them uh, on the internet if you just do a search for your industry followed by forum you're bound to find quite a few and once you've uh, spent some time on there and you've got to know the other people on the forum uh, it can be very useful and very very helpful and of course it can help you to avoid a lot of the stress in your life. One way to stay young is from the inside out, because what goes on on the inside is often reflected on the outside. And I'm going to talk about that in this video. And a balanced diet can help you to defy the signs of aging. Because if your body doesn't get the vitamins and minerals that it needs, not only is it not going to be able to provide the fuel to live your daily life to its full potential, but your cells are not going to renew properly, making you look old. So if you eat a lot of junk food, you know, stuff that's high in saturated fats, in sugar and simple carbs, then not only will you be obese, but your heart is going to have to work harder and your arteries are going to clog up with cholesterol, making it harder for nutrients to circulate. And when this happens, your body concentrates all of its efforts into keeping you alive. After all, that's its most important function. And maintenance gets pushed into second place. And your health deteriorates as a result, making you look older than you really are. And the converse is also true. You know, if you're getting the right amount of nutrition, then you'll have a healthy glow, making you look younger. And you'll also have more energy than your peers, again, making you look younger. So you know, you're going to actually act younger because you're going to have more energy than other people who are your age. Now, one thing that you should do to ensure that this happens is to always eat breakfast. That's actually very important. In fact, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But for so many people, this consists of either a cup of coffee on the go or a so-called breakfast bar that's laden with unhealthy fats and sugars. And so you're getting all the wrong sort of nutrition at the time when you really need the right nutrition the most. So a breakfast consisting of foods that are high in vitamins, proteins and slow release carbohydrates can keep your energy levels up till lunchtime. And you should sit down to eat it as well. You know, treat it like a proper meal. 
don't eat it on the go don't eat it on your commute uh, sit down have a proper meal you don't actually have to sit down at the table to eat it you can eat it on your lap on the sofa watching breakfast tv if you want if that's you know what makes it easier for you but you should treat it like a proper meal and set aside a proper amount of time to eat it and digest it and if necessary get up earlier so that you have time to do this you know, it's very important and you should also snack healthily there's nothing wrong with snacking but you should choose something that's healthy so for example choose fruit instead of candy or chips now fruit has got plenty of vitamins and it's got nothing artificial especially if you buy fresh fruit you know from uh, your local greengrocer or from your supermarket and so on and fruit that's in season is going to have all the nutrients that your body needs for the particular time of year so you're going to have slow release sugars during the winter time you're going to have fast release sugars during the spring and summer and if you can get something that's organically grown then that's even better because you're not going to be taking in things like pesticides and artificial fertilizer residue and that sort of thing so again it's healthier and it's going to be better for you and that's going to reflect in your appearance something else that you should do is to drink water instead of soft drinks now Soft drinks are full of corn syrup, they're full of processed sugars, and they've got lots of artificial colorings and flavorings, none of which do you any good. And carbonated spring water with a slice of lemon or a splash of fruit juice can be just as refreshing as a soft drink. And of course, spring water or bottled water is better for you than tap water, because it's less likely to contain things like fluoride or chlorine and other additives. And of course, tea and coffee are fine too, and they contain things like antioxidants that can be beneficial, especially tea. But of course, some people need the extra jolt of caffeine that you get from a nice cup of coffee. If you do that, then try if possible to get real coffee you know that's freshly ground and percolated or um, filter made rather than using instant coffee which can often have lots of artificial stuff in it and it's best to get your vitamins and minerals from food and eating as healthily as possible is always the best policy you know get fresh food get it organically grown if possible eat what's in season because that's what your body needs and as i was saying you know what goes on the inside is reflected on the outside but that said the way your body absorbs vitamins and minerals changes as you get older and in some cases your body doesn't absorb all the nutrients from your food in the time that it takes it to get through your digestive tract so you're not actually getting as many minerals and vitamins into your body into your bloodstream as you would do when you were younger even though you're eating a highly nutritious diet so in that case it's perfectly okay to top up your intake of nutrients with supplements now of course you should always check with your doctor or other health advisor first just to make sure that you're not suffering from any intolerances and that's very important and a good multivitamin and multimineral tablet taken once a day is enough for most people and uh, they are quite reasonably priced but you might need to top this up with additional supplements if necessary if you find that you are suffering from some sort of a deficiency now good ones to consider are vitamin c for keeping viruses at bay in fact um, i read an article once that said that no virus known to man is able to survive large amounts of vitamin c under laboratory conditions although there is of course a limit to the amount of vitamin c that your body can absorb but vitamin c is very good for keeping viruses at bay keeping coughs and colds at bay etc 
Vitamin D for your bones, it's just as good for you in adulthood as it is when you're a growing child. Potassium for blood pressure, citicoline for memory, zinc for appetite, and we could also add um, vitamin E for your eyesight, and there are a whole lot of others too. And if you do find that you're suffering from some sort of a deficiency, then of course talk to your doctor should be the first port of call. But also you can look things up on the internet to uh, give you some idea as to the sort of thing that you might need. Now, when you do decide to go for supplements, it's best to buy them from a specialist retailer instead of from a drugstore or a supermarket. And that's because the sort of things that you buy from the supermarket or from the drugstore tend to be much lower dosage than the ones you can buy from a specialist retailer or a health food store or that sort of thing. So you can make sure that you're getting the maximum amount of um, vitamins or minerals by talking to a specialist retailer. And a specialist retailer will have people on hand who understand how all these things work and can give you some good advice. So there you go. Looking good on the inside is reflected when you look good on the outside. Want to stay young? Then don't retire. Now, I know that's rather an odd thing to say, but please bear with me. I'll explain why in this video. You see, keeping your brain active is crucial to appearing younger and living longer. Now, think of your brain like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, eventually it's going to wither and die. You know, like the saying goes, use it or lose it. And so many people spend their whole lives at work and they do work that they find engaging, and they do work that they find stimulating, and then they retire and do nothing. They spend all day just simply staring out into space like this guy here. And they become bored, they become isolated, and they feel like their lives have absolutely no purpose. So don't become one of them. And the thing is, you don't have to keep working full time. You know, getting a part-time job that isn't too strenuous can get you out of the house, it can keep your brain active, and it can enable you to meet new people, all of which is very important. And for example, in the UK, the B&Q chain of home improvement stores made it their policy to hire older workers. And I think the oldest guy who works for them is in his 90s. But the management found that the older people who went to work for them, and they mostly work part-time, were more considerate and more conscientious than the younger people who worked there. And they also appreciated the fact that they could meet other people and that they could actually do something that was fulfilling and helpful. And so it was a win-win situation all round. Now, something else that you can do when you retire from your main occupation is to start your own business. You know, if you had a professional career, then you can become a consultant. And that's great because then you're passing your knowledge, the knowledge that you've acquired over a lifetime of working, on to the next generation. And you're helping to advise people who are perhaps just coming into the industry that you're leaving, uh, ways that they can become even more successful. So becoming a consultant is a great thing to do when uh, you retire from your main business. Or you can start your own online business, and this is great. You can do something like affiliate marketing, or you can sell on eBay. And of course, you can base your hours that you work around other activities in your life uh, because lots of people, of course, concentrate on hobbies and things like that when they've retired. Now, of course, some pension schemes, however, prohibit their pensioners from taking any paid employment. And this is particularly true of a lot of company pension schemes. They say that once you've retired, you're retired, you can't take on any other paid employment. But all is not lost though. What you can do is volunteer work. And 
helping out in a charity shop, in a school, or in a hospital can have all the benefits of working, you know, except the paycheck, of course. But you're still going to be active. You're still going to be meeting new people. You're still going to have some sort of purpose to your life, which can be very fulfilling and very rewarding. And of course, there are lots of people who keep working right on into their very old age. So let's take a look at some famous oldies who've kept working. And the first one is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom and her husband, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Now, at the time they're making this video, they are aged 90 and 95, respectively. Uh, which is pretty old to keep working, but the Queen has carried out 340 official engagements during 2015. That's the last year that the figures are available for. And that covers everything from meeting government ministers, being head of the Commonwealth, meeting the UK Prime Minister, the Commonwealth Prime Ministers, giving royal assent to a legislation from the UK and from other Commonwealth countries. It also means going out and doing things in the community, meeting people, etc. And even if those 340 official engagements were just cutting a ribbon or unveiling a foundation stone and making a short speech and shaking hands with people... You know, at the age of 90, that's quite a lot to do, and it's practically one every day. And Prince Philip, well, he did 250 official engagements in 2015, and he's also the patron or president of some 800 organisations. Now, even if he only gives each of them one hour of his time during the year, you know, you do the math. That takes up quite a lot of his time. And this picture that we're seeing here was taken in 2010. So uh, they were aged 84 and 89, respectively. But if you look at them, and if you didn't know who these two people were, you wouldn't think they were that age, would you? You'd think they were you know, perhaps in their 70s. And I'm sure that it's the fact that uh, they've done this day in, day out for over 60 years. The Queen came to the throne on the death of her father when she was 25 years old. And she's carried on this workload ever since. And I'm sure that is what keeps her quite young looking by comparison to her age. And I have actually personally seen the Queen and Prince Philip, albeit from a distance. And I tell you, they look just like you see them uh, on TV and in photographs. There's no uh, photoshopping gone on here. Now, Pablo Picasso, perhaps one of uh, history's most famous artists, he kept painting up to a few months before his death in 1973 at the age of 91. And indeed, they reckon that the last few years of his life were probably his most productive. And in 1967, when he was 86, he created this 50-foot-high sculpture and donated it to the people of Chicago. It's known as the Chicago Picasso. But he did this at the age of 86, which is over 20 years after the usual retirement age for most people. So he was still going even on into his 80s. Uh, at the time they're making this video, Warren Buffett known as the Sage of Omaha, is still chairman, president and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, one of the world's largest corporations at the age of 86. And Sir Winston Churchill first became the British Prime Minister at the age of 65, and that was the retirement age in the UK at the time. So at the time when a lot of people were retiring, he was actually coming into his prime and actually occupying the top job for the first time. And he became Prime Minister again in the 1950s at the age of 79, and he only retired as a member of parliament in 1964, during the general election of 1964, at the age of 89. And that was only really because his health was declining. He'd had a stroke and uh, was in a wheelchair and uh, was in quite poor health. And his wife persuaded him that perhaps he should stand down as a member of parliament. And uh, he did. And of course, he died the following year. 
Coco Chanel was working on her Fashion Houses spring catalogue only a few days before she fell ill and died in 1971 at the age of 87, but she was still very much in control of the Chanel brand right up to almost the very end. And, of course, the Rolling Stones have a combined age of 289 years. The youngest member, Ronnie Wood, is a sprightly 69 years old, and they're still touring and making music. So the message is very clear. Just work on, not fade away. Learning new skills helps to keep your brain young. And in fact, learning any type of new skill can be beneficial because it activates the part of your brain that's geared for learning. And it does it just as much in your adult life as it did during your school days. And it doesn't really matter what you learn as long as you learn something new. And you're never too old to learn something new. Specifically, though, there are a few things which have been proven to help boost brain capacity as you get older. And the first one is learning a new language. And this form of brain training is a constant way of keeping your mind active and engaged. And it has other benefits as well. After all, if you learn to, say, speak Spanish, you might then want to go and visit Spain or Mexico or countries in South America where you can actually practice this language. So it gives you something else to look forward to, something else to think about in addition to just simply learning the new language. And according to a study published in 2007, Having the ability to speak a second language may delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by up to four and a half years, which is pretty good. Now, research is still being done to find out specifically why it causes such a great delay, but it's been suggested that it's a result of being able to switch between languages and being able to suppress one language while speaking another. And this is according to research done by retireathome.com. Now, something else that you can learn uh, as you get older, and in fact, throughout your life, are computer games. Now, some people think computer games are a waste of time. It's something that teenagers do when they should be outside playing in the sunshine or studying or doing something else. But they are wrong. In a study published by the Journal of Neuroscience, College students who played Super Mario 3D World for two weeks improved their memory recall by about 12%, which I'm sure you'll agree is quite significant. And it doesn't just apply to young people. You know, it can apply to older people as well. And playing video games by the elderly has been shown to ward off symptoms of dementia and to help boost memory. And again, just like learning a new language, it's because you had to learn the moves, you had to learn the rules, you had to learn how to do different things within the video game, and it helps your hand-eye coordination, and it does all sorts of good things. In fact, this website here, Brain Metrics, that's metrix.com forward slash memory hyphen game, actually has some very good games on their website that you can play for free. And in particular, this memory game, which is uh, something which you can do to help exercise your memory, do things like remember faces or things that you've heard, etc. And it has a lot of interesting information about it right here on the site. And also, they have some other brain training games that you can access on the site as well, things like Eight Queens or Arrange Games brain fitness, brain reflection, etc. And they are very, very good, and it's well worth a visit. And uh, it's all free online. And something else that you can learn how to do is how to cook new recipes. And learning to cook new recipes can be beneficial in several ways. First of all, you need to learn how to do it. And just like I was saying earlier on in the video, 
this activates the same learning mechanisms in your brain that you used to use when you were at school. But also, it introduces you to new foodstuffs, which are things that might be healthier than what you're already eating. And of course, when you learn how to cook a different recipe, often it's a good excuse for having friends and family round for dinner. And of course, social interaction helps to boost your memory. So it has a lot of beneficial things. You know, it's win, win, win all along. And so every time you can learn a new skill, that schoolboy or schoolgirl deep inside you comes back to the fore and you get to think yourself much younger than you did before. You need to get out more if you want to stay youthful. And lots of people, both young and old, don't do much socialising outside of their work. And they come home, they eat dinner, and they spend the rest of the evening and much of the weekend in front of the TV, and they have absolutely no social interaction with anybody outside perhaps their immediate family at all. And the problem gets even worse for retired people or for entrepreneurs who work from home. You know, sometimes they don't see or speak to anyone, again, apart from perhaps their immediate family, for days or even weeks at a time. And this is terrible because being socially active is a great way to keep ageing at bay. Meeting new people keeps your brain active. You take an interest in others and you need to get to know them and to figure them out. And quite often, I'm sure everybody knows when you go and you meet someone for the first time, you, you, you get to know them. You have to learn about them. You have to think about them. You have to, uh, you have to try and figure them out. And that means that you have to work your brain. Whereas when you're around people that you know well, you know them so well, you could probably finish off their sentences for them. And then your brain really isn't having to work very hard. And this exercises parts of your brain that you probably don't use very often if you spend all day staring at your TV or talking to the same people day in, day out, like I was just saying. So attending social gatherings with family and friends or attending sports fixtures or other events is a great way to actually meet people to be in different surroundings and to interact with all sorts of other people who you perhaps don't know or don't know very well. Or perhaps you might want to take up a hobby or a sport, and that can be beneficial too. I mean, for example, take the golfers in this photograph here. You can see there's quite a broad age range, and golf is a sport that's played by both young and old. And this is very important because being around or being in tune with other younger people keeps you up to date with the latest ideas, keeps you up to date with the latest fashions, keeps you up to date with the latest trends. And also you find out what's going on in different people's lives. You find out uh, all sorts of different things that are happening. And again, that helps to keep your brain active. And the more active your brain is, the more forward thinking you're going to be the more youthful you're going to be especially again if you look at the way that younger people look and the way that young people act uh, some of that's going to rub off on you if you're around them long enough and of course other people have different life experiences and they probably think in different ways to you so they may provide solutions to problems that you're having in your life you know problems that are causing you a lot of aging stress and worry and other people may also know about the latest technology, the latest music, the latest movies, etc., etc. And all of this helps you to feel younger and to look and act in a less staid manner. Travel is also important if you want to stay young. You know the old saying, travel broadens the mind. So, Visiting somewhere you've never been before 
helps to form new memories, and of course, it gives you something new to talk about. Uh, talk about to people that you know and to people that you've just encountered. And sometimes you might feel like visiting somewhere for the first time because someone that you've met has told you about it. And revisiting places from the past helps to cement older memories and to keep them fresh in your mind. And you might even bump into people you used to know and revive even more old memories. And you can catch up on what's going on in the wider world. And again, being in touch with what's going on, not being out of touch like lots of older people are who are very set in their ways, can make you look, feel and act much more youthful than you really are. Is cosmetic surgery worth it? Well, I'm going to answer that question in this video. Cosmetic surgery, aka plastic surgery, was once the preserve of the rich and famous. Nowadays, though, prices have come down and it's within reach of almost anyone. And the most popular procedures done these days, according to WebMD.com, are lipoplasty, also known as liposuction, eyelid surgery, breast implants, nose jobs, facelifts, and Botox injections. And the thing is, if these procedures are expensive in your own country, you can always go to another cheaper country for your surgery. And there are lots of countries around the world where a good part of their economy is actually based on foreign cosmetic surgery. Uh, countries like Mexico and Brazil, uh, Spain, Croatia, Turkey, India and Pakistan, uh, South Africa. They're all countries where people can go and get cosmetic surgery done because it's cheaper than in their home countries, especially if you live in the US or the UK or Australia or countries like that where these sort of procedures can be quite expensive. And of course, you can get cheap air travel to these places. So, you know, the, the fact that people can travel around more and you can book this stuff over the internet has made it much more available to a lot more people than it used to be years ago. So we come back to the original question, is cosmetic surgery worth it? Well, it depends. So let's look at the pros and cons. Let's look at the pros. Well, first of all, cosmetic surgery will improve your appearance. That's the whole point, isn't it? And when you look better, you feel better, you feel better about yourself, and that gives your confidence a boost. And cosmetic surgery can make you look younger, especially if you have a procedure like a facelift or you have Botox. And of course, if you uh, look younger, if you look uh, healthier, then you have better career prospects. You, know, you reach a certain age and... Um, employers don't really consider you anymore. You appear to be past it. But sometimes if you look younger, if you look healthier, then your career prospects are going to be better. And of course, it can make you more attractive to prospective partners as well. And of course, there are some medical advantages to having cosmetic surgery. For example, you might breathe better after a nose job if you uh, had difficulty breathing because of the shape of your nose, then you might be able to breathe much better once you've had that attended to. And dental implants may help you chew better. You know, if you've had some teeth extracted in the past, you might not be able to eat as healthily as somebody who's got a full set of teeth. So if you've had dental implants, then uh, that can help. You might have a better diet and that can improve your general health and your general appearance as well. And of course, there's reconstruction following an accident. So if you've been in a car crash or some other work-related accident that's left you disfigured, perhaps you were burned or scalded or 
had cuts and bruises and all sorts of other things have gone wrong, broken bones perhaps, broken nose, you can have that reconstruction done and it can not only make you look better, but it can also make you function better as a human being. But of course, there are always a downside, so let's look at the cons. And the biggest downside is the cost. And unless it is for medical reasons, then most insurance won't cover it. Most health services in countries around the world where they have um, the government pays your health costs, uh, they probably won't pay for it either because it's considered to be uh, not something that is particularly necessary. So you will have to meet the full cost of it uh, out of your own pocket. And even if you do go to a country where it's cheaper than your home country, you still have to pay for it. So there is always a cost involved and it can be quite substantial. Then there's the risk, the risk of anything going wrong during the surgery. I mean, you know, Cosmetic surgery is no different from any other type of surgery in that respect that something might go wrong while you're having the operation done and that might need to be corrected and there is a risk, you know, a risk to life in some cases. And there also in some countries, if you go uh, overseas for your treatment, uh, their standards of uh, hygiene might be somewhat lower than in your own home country. And of course, there can be post-operative complications. Again, just like with any other type of surgery, something could go wrong afterwards. There could be some other type of complication uh, that has to be taken into consideration. So there is always a big risk with cosmetic surgery, just like there is with any other type of surgery. And of course, it can be disappointing. You might have some idea in your mind as to how you're going to look after the surgery, but it doesn't come out the way that you thought. And it can be disappointing. You might think that uh, actually you look worse after having cosmetic surgery, especially if something goes wrong during the surgery and it doesn't come out as well as you might like. So it can be disappointing. And of course, it can leave you open to ridicule. People who didn't know you before the surgery, well, they won't know any different. But people who did know you, well, they might think you're being vain or frivolous. So you do have to take that into consideration as well. The thing is, though, you don't have to go under the knife to improve your appearance. And there are some things that you can do to make yourself look younger without having to resort to cosmetic surgery. And the first thing and probably the easiest thing that you can do is to change the way you dress. So update your wardrobe to something more contemporary, but choose clothing that someone 10 years younger than you would wear. And that might mean, you know, if you're a guy, it might mean wearing a different tie width than you might usually wear. Or if you're a girl, it might mean wearing a different skirt length than you might usually wear. But something that someone who's, say, 10 years younger than you is going to wear is going to, by default, make people think that you're a bit younger, too. Then you can update your hairstyle. And... You know, your hair grows and it needs cutting every so often, even if you wear it long. So if you've had the same hairdo for more than five years, then ask your stylist for something more contemporary and just update it so that you appear to be more in tune with current trends. And if your hair is going grey, well, dye it. And that applies to guys as much as it does to girls. You know, grey hair might suit George Clooney, but that doesn't go for everybody. So if your hair's going grey, then you should dye it back to the colour that it was before. Or maybe even choose something completely different. But if you do decide to dye your hair, then be sure to choose a product that only covers the grey and doesn't strip out all of the natural oils. If you wear glasses, then you should get more fashionable frames. You should always have your eyes checked every few years anyway. And when you do and you choose another pair of glasses, choose something that's a bit more updated. Don't ask your uh, optometrist to simply put your new lenses in your old frames. 
have something new, have something that's a bit more up to date. And if you're a woman who wears makeup, then update your look to the latest techniques. You know, have a chat with the lady on the makeup counter at the store where you buy your cosmetics and ask her about the latest techniques. And a lot of cosmetic houses do actually run classes which show you how to apply their makeup in the latest way. And quite often they're free because they're designed to uh, try and sell you more cosmetics. But at least you'll know exactly how things are done these days and you'll keep up to date with the latest techniques. And something else you should do, be you male or female, is to moisturize. Make sure you get lots of moisturizer onto your skin. Because a healthy looking skin can take years off of you. And you should also moisturize your hands as well as your face. So many times people will look young in the face, but when you look at their hands, it's always a dead giveaway. So moisturize your hands as well as your face. Now, browsing fashion magazines is a great way to keep on top of what's hot right now. So be sure to stop by your local newsstand or your local news agent regularly and catch up on the latest ideas. So is cosmetic surgery worth it? Well, that depends. Depends how you feel about it and also depends on whether or not you've tried some of the other techniques we've talked about in this video. One way to keep young is to keep active. And when we were kids, we were tend to be very active. I don't know about you, but when I was very young, I was always running around and going out and riding my bike and doing all sorts of different things that burnt up lots of energy and kept me active all the time. But of course, as we get older, we become more sedentary. We tend to take sit-down jobs these days, and we travel everywhere by car, so we don't really get a lot of exercise when we're moving from one place to the other. Now, some people join a gym and work out, but unfortunately, most people don't, and this is a big mistake. Because an extra... 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week could extend your life by an extra 3.4 years. And even doing 75 minutes a week, you know, I mean, that's just over 10 minutes a day, could earn you another 1.8 years. And those are pretty good reasons to exercise. And this statistics are courtesy of PLOS Medicine. And of course, the main benefits of exercise are to your heart. Because rigorous exercise will allow the left ventricle of your heart to enlarge, just like it would with any other muscle. And you'll be able to move more blood around the body with each pump and deliver more nutrients and more oxygen to your muscles and tissues. And, of course, that means that your body cells can repair themselves just that much quicker. Your heart won't have to work as hard, and your resting heart rate will be lower, as will your blood pressure. And all that will reduce your risk of a stroke or a heart attack. So it's more than just looking, it is actually keeping your whole body much younger. And, of course, keeping your muscles in condition means that they won't deteriorate and you'll be able to stay more mobile. And this can help ward off arthritis and other age-related complaints. So, again, it's keeping your body young. It'll also keep your weight down. Now, in the US, more than two-thirds, that's 68.8% of adults, are considered to be overweight or obese. And more than one third, that's 35.7% of adults, are considered to be obese. More than one in 20, that's 6.3%, have extreme obesity. And almost three out of four men, or 74%, are considered to be overweight or obese. And I'm sure these figures are similar in most other Western countries. And, you know, that really 
tells a story about the way that most people live their lives. They simply don't exercise enough. And when you're not burning off the calories to uh, move around, then your body lays that down as fat. And of course, there are all the other health implications that come along with that. And of course, fat people don't look particularly youthful. And according to the Alzheimer's Society, regular exercise can significantly reduce the risk of developing dementia by about 30%. And for Alzheimer's disease specifically, the risk was reduced by 45%. And these are very good reasons to exercise because, after all, Alzheimer's is a disease generally considered of the elderly. So what sort of exercise should you do to keep active and keep young? Well, it doesn't have to be too strenuous. You know, just going for a run, a jog or a brisk walk every day or doing some other type of exercise that leaves you slightly out of breath can be beneficial, especially if you start doing it during your youth or in your middle years. You could also join a gym or hire a personal trainer or a personal fitness instructor or a coach to devise an exercise program for you. But no matter how you do it, the earlier you start, the younger you'll stay. In this video, I want to talk about sleep, which is nature's healer and rejuvenator. And getting a good night's sleep is important because it helps your body in a number of different ways. First and foremost, getting enough sleep makes you look healthier and more attractive. And that's according to a 2010 study published in the British Medical Journal. And researchers photographed 23 people after a period of sleep deprivation and after a normal night's sleep of about eight hours. And the photos were shown to 65 people who rated each photo based on health, attractiveness and tiredness. And the sleep-deprived group scored lower in all three categories. And of course, when you get a decent night's sleep, you'll live longer too. Because regularly sleeping less than you should is associated with a shorter lifespan, although it's not clear whether little sleep is the cause or an effect of other illnesses. And studies have found people who routinely sleep for fewer than six hours a night have a higher risk of dying sooner than people of a similar age who sleep for seven or eight hours a night. And this is according to the website bodyandsoul.com.au. And of course, sleep heals you from the inside out. When you sleep, your brain triggers the release of hormones that encourage tissue growth. And this can help you recover from injuries such as cuts or even sore muscles from your last workout. And during sleep, you make more white blood cells that attack viruses and bacteria. And that's why sleep is often called nature's healer because when you're asleep you're getting more white blood cells and you uh, concentrate your energy on beating any infection that you might be suffering from. And in one study people who slept for at least eight hours a night were three times less likely to come down with a cold than those who got seven hours or less and that's according to the good people at webmd.com. And your blood pressure dips as you sleep. And this may give your heart a break. You know, it might allow you to rest your heart slightly so it's not having to pump round quite so much. And there may be other heart health benefits too. So how much sleep is enough? Well, according to the Mayo Clinic, for most adults, between seven and nine hours is sufficient. And older adults need about the same amount of sleep as younger adults. So you're looking at uh, the sort of the higher end of that scale there. But 
As you get older, your sleeping patterns might change, though, and older adults tend to sleep more lightly and for shorter time spans than do younger adults, although the amount of sleep probably remains the same. So the more you sleep, the more your body rejuvenates, the healthier you'll be, and the younger you'll look. It's no secret that good health equals youthful, both in youthful appearance, in youthful mobility, and in a youthful attitude as well. Because after all, if you're not having to concentrate on getting better, if you're not in poor health, then you're going to have a much more positive outlook on life. So it's important that you see your doctor for regular health checkups as you get older. This helps to prevent problems developing or from worsening. And if you have a family history of certain diseases or ailments, then a regular health check is essential. And I don't just mean if your parents or your grandparents had health problems. You also want to look at your wider family. If your siblings start to come down with some sort of health problem, there's a good chance that you might have it too. So you need to get yourself checked out. And the same goes for a bit further afield, you know, uncles, aunts, cousins, etc. Any blood relative that has some sort of ailment or some sort of disease which could be inherited means there's a good chance that you might have it too so you do need to get yourself checked out under those circumstances so what sort of things should you get your doctor to check for and what sort of questions should you ask and what sort of things should you ask about when you have a checkup well i suppose perhaps the most important thing is cancer screening because if you treat cancer early enough then you can literally save your life so we're talking things like breast cancer cervical cancer prostate cancer colon cancer and lung cancer particularly if you're a smoker or if you have smoked in the past you want to make sure that uh, there's nothing untoward going on there you also want to get your doctor to check your cholesterol. And this is particularly important if you're over 40, because then cholesterol can start to build up. You also want to have regular checks of your blood pressure, because that can be an indicator of poor heart health. So you want to get that checked out. You also want to get checked out for HIV or AIDS if you're in a high risk group. So if you're gay or if you've had a blood transfusion in the past or if you are or have been an intravenous drug user and have shared needles then you want to make sure that you regularly get checked out to make sure you're not developing HIV or full-blown AIDS. You also want to have a blood test to look for viruses in case you're suffering from any other type of viruses. And particularly, you want to have your doctor check out if you're suffering from any what's known as low-level viruses. Now, these are viruses that don't generally manifest themselves with any particular symptoms, but they can just simply make you feel off-colour all the time and uh, make you perhaps more susceptible to getting colds and sore throats and that sort of thing. And quite often, if you don't have a lot of energy, if you're feeling sort of generally blah all the time, it may well be that you're suffering from a low-level virus and you want to get that checked out. You should also see your dentist regularly. Bad teeth can be very aging, and extractions can cause hollow cheeks, which can put years on your appearance. Also, good oral health can lead to good general health because your body isn't having to fight oral infections. And your dentist can also look for signs of mouth cancer and can detect it early. So you should go and see your dentist at least once a year, preferably twice a year, just for a regular checkup. You should also keep up to date with any vaccinations and inoculations. 
And this is particularly important if you do a lot of traveling. If you go to countries where certain diseases are endemic, but they're not native to the country where you live, then obviously that puts you at a much higher risk of contracting those infections. So if you're going to any country outside the immediate area where you live, then you should go and see a doctor ahead of time to make sure that you have all the uh, jabs that you need to keep you healthy. And you should also, during the course of having your checkup, review any existing health problems and note any changes. You know, have you noticed any body changes, including lumps or skin changes? Are you having pain, dizziness, fatigue, problems with urine or stool or menstrual cycle changes? Have your eating habits changed? Are you experiencing depression, anxiety, trauma, distress or sleeping problems? All these could be uh, an indicator of something more serious going on. So you do need to discuss this with your doctor during your checkup. And if problems are caught and solved early enough, not only will you live a longer, healthier life, but you'll have a better quality of life too.